As a kid, some of my favorite moments in any movie were the final scenes in The Godfather. The first scene I remember was the one where Tessio, played by A.J. Vigoda, an old friend and family member, is being led to the slaughter, and he asks to be let go for old time's sake, but is refused. It was so chilling and clinical. Next was the scene where Carlo is forced to pay for Sonny's death. The idea that Michael allowed Carlo to move into a house close to him gave him a large stake in the family business, and agreed to be godfather to his son while biding his time to kill him made a big impression on me. Michael also made an impression on me. He seemed a colder person than his father, less emotional. I was motivated to find the book and read it. It explained a bit more in depth the motivations behind the character's actions. But although the book made an impression on me, I was neither Italian nor a member of the mafia. I had grown up in a good middle-class neighborhood, attended a small but prestigious university, and after earning degrees in general business and accounting, took a job at a decent firm near my parents' home as an entry-level staff accountant. I did all the usual things a guy my age and position should do. Went to outdoor parties, threw episodes with girls in the back seat of my car that never went too far, listened to music. I never dated a cheerleader, wasn't class president or a member of a sports team. I was just an ordinary kid with good grades who was destined to live an ordinary middle-class life. I met Tracy through mutual friends at church. We were both active in the local youth group at our Southern Baptist Church and went to church events together. We dated, fell in love, and married shortly after I graduated from college. She went to the local community college and got a job as a medical secretary. We worked and saved and eventually had enough money for a down payment on a small starter home, a three-bedroom ranch with a two-car garage in a decent neighborhood. Soon children came along. First a boy, Thomas, named after my dad, then a girl, Mary, named after Tracy's mom. After the second child was born, Tracy had her tubes tied, so we had nothing else. I loved the idea, as I would only be 42 years old when my youngest turned 18. The next few years flew by like a blink of an eye. I progressed in my job, slowly but surely moving up the career ladder, while Tracy's job seemed more relaxed. The small office didn't offer much opportunity for advancement, but they were flexible with her work schedule, allowing her to spend time with the kids when needed. Plus, both her and my parents lived in the same neighborhood, so we had an extended family support group. I had been working longer, having recently been promoted to accounts payable manager, but I aspired to something more, like vice president or even CFO. I got along well with both the current VP of finance and CFO, and in our company it is customary to promote employees from within. Life, as they say, went on as it should until Tommy turned 14. And it wasn't about Tommy or Mary, it was about Tracy. Sixteen years later, I realized something was wrong. For starters, Two days a week, always on Tuesdays and Thursdays. She started dressing better for work. It wasn't a big deal. She wasn't switching from a work suit to a club suit or anything like that. And basically, everyone where she worked wore one form of scrubs or another. There wasn't much change. But I could notice it. A little more makeup or lipstick. A little more perfume. Instead of sneakers, shoes with a slight heel. But even more devastating was the underwear. Matching bras and panties thongs, boy shorts, and lace. Not the usual sensible underwear that you can wear under your scrubs, but the kind you can see from underneath. On top of that, our sex life exploded. Not that I was complaining, but after 16 years, we'd slowed down a bit. There was something forced, rushed about it that alarmed me. Like Tracy felt she had to do it with me. I think there were red flags all over the place, but I didn't want Tracy to know I'd noticed them. I had to go out of town for that, but I was able to secure the services of a solid firm of private investigators. Our town isn't small, but we're not in a big city either, and I needed them to be competent as well as discreet. I didn't need anyone to see me walk into a lawyer's or detective's office. News, like gossip, has a way of spreading. It wasn't long before I had a full report. Tracy was meeting with a man twice a week for two-hour sessions at a hotel in a neighboring town, I guess she was careful about gossip, too. His name was Jim Evans. He was a medical salesman, and she had met him through work. He was married, had two children, and was about four years younger than us. I had complete information about him. Dates of their meetings, audio recordings, photographs, and a videotape of one of their sessions where my private investigator bribed the clerk to allow him to put a camera in the room. 
All of this was inadmissible in court, but I wasn't going to go to court with it. I made inquiries about a good divorce lawyer, again in a town or two from us, and found one who came highly recommended to me. He was, as they say, a shark, and was famous for getting tough deals for his clients. I made an appointment on Monday morning at 9 o'clock, took some time off work, and went to see him. Basically, the lawyer told me I was screwed. If I went for the divorce, I could expect her to get the house, child support for children under 18, some form of maintenance since my salary was higher, plus a 50-50 division of our other assets. I could plan on living in a small apartment for the next six years and seeing the kids on weekends. We lived in a no-fault state, so adultery was not admissible in court, and since she didn't bring her lover into the house, I couldn't argue that she was an unfit mother. However, I had some moral authority, especially because of the photographs, and the fact that her lover was also married gave me some leverage if I wanted to use it. I told him I wanted a few days to think about it, and then contacted him again and asked him to draw up a separation agreement in accordance with my instructions. I was very specific about what I wanted to include in the agreement and, although he didn't quite understand, followed my instructions exactly. He prepared the papers, made copies for Tracy and I to sign and notarize, and filed them with the court. I decided that Saturday would be D-Day, the day I would meet with her. I remember reading once about a CEO of a major oil company who spent 40 hours preparing for every one-hour meeting with the head of state. I probably spent 40 hours or more preparing for that meeting with my wife. I had papers from attorneys, separation agreement, private investigators' report, photographs, everything, everything was prepared in a folder. I also researched information on marriage counselors and found several that were perfect for my purposes. All three had a lot of negative feedback from husbands thinking they were too lenient with adulterous wives. I spoke with our pastor and received a verbal promise from him to help us with additional counseling. The separation agreement was seemingly very generous, but also very specific. It provided that Tracy could use the house until the youngest child turned 18, after which time the house would be sold and the entire equity divided. Conversely, it provided that one of us could buy the house from the other, paying half the value of the equity and assuming any remaining mortgage payments. Child support was generous especially based on my current salary, and would cease when each child turned 18, and maintenance was minimal and only lasted for two years after the divorce became effective. But the combination of the two was significant and would hit my financial situation hard. Our current assets, including savings, checks, 401k, etc., were counted and listed, and Tracy was entitled to half of the value, which was due within 90 days of the divorce being finalized. In total, she could receive 50% of our assets and 65% of my income for the next few years. In addition, I needed to maintain insurance for the children until they graduated from college. From my perspective, two important points were that all amounts were frozen as of the signing of the agreement. And unlike a typical separation agreement, where if one party does not contest it within 90 days, it automatically goes to divorce, this agreement never went to divorce but remained in effect until one or the other party executed it. In other words, instead of an automatic divorce, it hung like the sword of Damocles over both parties, and either party could pull the trigger at any time. There was also a provision that if, after the contract was signed, either party challenged the terms of the contract and lost, they would get nothing. All in all, it was a very generous offer I made to my wife. And it was a gamble, because if she went through with the divorce, I was facing at least six very difficult financial years. But it was a calculated gamble that I intended to win. First, I had proof of the affair. Notarized private investigator statements, photographs, audio and video recordings. Although useless in court, the consequences for Tracy if I revealed them to her parents, family, friends, church members, and children would be devastating. Second, being married and having children of her own, her lover was in no position to help and stood to lose as much, if not more, than she would have if the affair had been disclosed. Thus, she essentially had no support group, as she could not turn to me for help and would not ask her parents or friends for fear of exposure. However, I would insist that she hire her own attorney to review the documents and pay for it. Third, I was ready, legally and emotionally, to leave the marriage. I knew it would be difficult financially, and that I would see my children less often, 
but I watched the video and all the love I had for my wife was gone along with the disrespect she had shown me by being with another man. Thus I was tossing her a big carrot. I would stay and work on her forgiveness versus a little stick. I didn't want her to be afraid of the stick and grab the carrot. I made arrangements with my parents to take the kids out for the night. We went out to a nice dinner, and then when I got home, I asked to talk to her in the living room. I laid out the facts in a business-like tone. I talked about the private investigator's report and what I knew. She immediately started crying and apologizing. Why do they always claim it was just sex and meant nothing? It meant something to me. It meant that my wife, the one who had sworn her fidelity to me in front of God, family, and friends, had not been faithful. Did her vows mean nothing to her either? I gave her a divorce settlement, which triggered another wave of tears. She promised to break up with Jim immediately and begged me to forgive me unless I divorced her. I explained that a separation agreement is not a divorce and does not have to escalate into a divorce if she fulfills certain conditions. However, the conditions themselves, marriage counseling, counseling with our pastor, signing the separation agreement, and of course never seeing Jim Evans again, were pretty lenient, although not negotiable. I explained that I would pay her attorney fees and, if he agreed, she could sign the document. I would stay in the house and we could share a bedroom, but not sleep together until she was tested for STDs so that no one would know about it, so that her family, friends, and children would never know what she did. I also would not let Mr. Evans' wife find out about his affair with her and would not retaliate against him, but not out of kindness to him, but to protect her reputation. Needless to say, it happened exactly as I wanted it to. Tracy's lawyer approved and Tracy signed the agreement, which remained in the deed, unexecuted. We met with a pastor who advised prayer and forgiveness. We went to counseling where the counselor blamed me for part of the problems, which I graciously accepted. Even after marriage counseling ended, Tracy continued to meet privately with her monthly for several years. By the time three years had passed, she had essentially reduced her blame for what had happened to zero, and instead felt it was something she almost deserved. As time went on, the STD test came back negative and we resumed marital relations. For the first year, Tracy tried to kill me in bed, but eventually we got back into the marital rut. But basically, I was stalling. I wanted six years, would have been happy with five, but ended up with six and a half. As they say, once you cheat, you always cheat and I could see the pattern forming again. Tracy never really accepted her guilt the first time, and her psychologist confirmed this, so it was pretty easy for her to fall back into that state. She was smarter this time, but so was I. I kept the private investigator on constant discreet surveillance. Nothing too onerous or expensive, just a quick scan for a week or so every six months, and they picked up on her latest affair. Again, I had a complete package of documents, audio, and video recordings. It was another married man, but this time, he didn't just walk away. About 18 months ago, I'd taken them out on Jimmy Evans again and documented two new affairs about six months apart. So now I had three reports, one on my wife and her latest lover, one on Mike Wallace, and two on Jimmy Evans. To be clear, I planned to get my revenge on Jimmy and Tracy six years later. The affair with Mike was just more ammunition. The divorce agreement was still on file, and since we had stipulated an open-ended contract, I had my attorney draw it up. The terms had already been negotiated and signed. The dollar amounts were fixed six years ago. All that remained was an ongoing appraisal, recently, and the mortgage balance to be paid. But a lot has changed in six years. Both kids turned 18, so child support was no longer an issue. I had accumulated most of my paycheck, including bonuses over the past six years, but since the amounts subject to division were frozen six years ago, most of it was not subject to division. The monthly alimony amount was minimal. The agreement was based on the combined amount of alimony and child support, as well as an outdated salary that has since multiplied. And since we had recently remortgaged the house to prepay both kids' college tuition, the equity in the house was minimal. Simply put, what had been an overly generous 60-40 split of assets and income in Tracy's favor six years ago was now a less than generous 90-10 split in my favor. I had the money in the bank to pay her off in full, including my share of the equity, 
while Tracy had neither the income nor the ability to buy me out or pay off the mortgage. Once again, I chose Friday evening for our confrontation. That afternoon, I sent Jim Evans' wife a full package detailing his last two affairs, as well as a package to the husbands of the women concerned, and another to his employer, since both women worked for his clients. Another package I sent to Mike Wallace's wife and his employer. I invited Tracy to dinner, and then seated her in the same living room. Again, I laid out the facts in a businesslike manner. I showed her the folders that had been sent to Jim Evans and Mike Wallace's wives and their employers. I showed her the folders that were ready to go out to her, detailing numerous affairs over a six-year period. I explained that the fact that they were two affairs six years apart would get lost in the barrage of disapproval she would receive from her parents and friends. As I explained, people tend to believe the worst. And if I documented that she'd had two affairs, they'd assume there were more. And I explained that the papers had already been filed, the divorce would take place on the terms she had agreed to, and if she contested them, she would lose even the little I had given her. Tracy cried, begged, and pleaded with me. She said again that it was nothing personal, just sex. She swore it would never happen again, that this time she had learned her lesson. She asked me to forgive her again and accept her back on the basis of the long years we had spent together and our common bond, in other words, to forgive her for old time's sake. But as Tom Hagen said in The Godfather, it didn't work out. I was lenient after all, she was the mother of my children, but I wasn't fooled. I kept the house, most of my income, and set aside money to pay two years' maintenance, as well as equity on the house from my account. Given my current income, it was a pittance, less than my last bonus. I was 42 years old, the age I planned to be when my children left home, and I had been recently promoted to vice president at my job and was aiming for CFO in a few years. In short, I was living the life I wanted to live and was young enough to find a younger, more reliable woman to share that life with. Many would say that my revenge was rather weak. I didn't break any legs and I let my wife go easily, albeit penniless. Both men were left fighting for their marriages and perhaps their jobs, but neither of them had a bone broken. But as I said at the beginning, I deal with finance, not the mafia. I deal in dollars and cents, not broken legs. And in my case, I cheated the system to work in my favor when the deck was stacked against me. I delayed my revenge by keeping my enemies close. But I eventually discovered that delayed revenge is not a refusal to retaliate.